Welcome back to my tutorial series on how to make a game using Flutter in Flame. In this episode, we're finally adding in the jump button for mobile so we can finally play our game on a mobile device. We're also fixing some bugs and improving our code. We've got a lot to do, so let's get started. To get started, we're going to create our jump button in Figma, figma.com. I'll put a link to it in the description. Uh, we used this last time to create our joystick, and now we're going to create a similar icon for our jump button. To do that, we can come up to the square and hit the ellipse uh, and then just click to get a circle. We'll come over to the right and click the chain to make it linked and then change the width from 100 to 64 so it's the same size as our joystick. We could probably tweak these later if we want to but we'll just keep it for this size unless you find a better size for you. We want to make sure that these are the same colors as our joystick. So if we go to our joystick, we can see that we're using all black at a 50% opacity. So we can go back to our circle and then do the same. Hit 0, 0 and enter to make it all zeros and then 50% opacity. So we're good with the background of our button. Now what we need to do is add in a jump icon so that we know that this is a jump button. We can do that by coming up to the resources, go to plugins, and then search for material to get material design icons. If we click this, we now have a bunch of different icons that we can use, and we're going to just search for arrow up. There's a lot of different arrow ups that you could use, some that already have circles if you want to just use one of those, but we're going to create our own so you can see how to make your own custom icons or buttons or UI or whatever you want to make. We're going to choose this big arrow right here. We can go ahead and click that, and now we have an arrow. Always make sure that you're selecting the arrow up bold frame and not just the vector, or you're going to get some issues. So with the uh, frame selected, we're going to click the little eye uh, chain again, and then switch the size from 24 to 64, which will make it pretty big to make it look in, uh, good inside of our circle. We do want to make sure that this icon is the same color as this, just so they match. So we can go to our knob to see what color we use and it was all A's with a 50% opacity. So we can change the same with our icon, go back to the arrow up bold, and then for the selection colors, change it to AA and hit enter, and then 50% opacity. Perfect. Now with our arrow up bold selected, we can actually just drag it into the center of our circle, and you should get some frames that uh, pop up or lines, guidelines, I guess is what it's called, that'll say that it's perfectly centered. You could also select both of them by holding shift and click and then use these buttons up here to make sure that they're perfectly centered as well. With them both selected, we're going to hit control G to group them and then we're going to double click the group one and rename it to jump button and then we can come down to export with that selected and then export as a PNG export jump button. This will take it to our downloads and now we can go back to our code and bring that into our project. So inside of our project we have our folder open. We just want to go to our assets, right click and then reveal in file explorer and we can drag that over here so you can see it. We're going to double click into our assets folder, into our images folder and then into our HUD folder where we already have our joystick and knob and we're going to just drag in our jump button from our downloads. We can now close out of this and now we have access to our jump button that we can start using. To start using our jump button, we want to go into our lib folder, go into our components, and we want to make a new component for our jump button. We can right click new file and call it jump underscore button dot dart. Now we're only going to be using this button once, so we don't have to make it super dynamic. You can if you want to, but we're not going to. We're going to just hard code all of the data inside, but feel free to make it more dynamic if we need to, or in the future if you want to use this. So we'll do class jump button with a capital J, and then this is going to extend a sprite component because we're using a sprite, aka our image. Now we don't need to pass in any uh, variables or um, parameters, so we can just call an empty constructor. And then what we do need to do is we need to use our onload so we can actually give it the information that we want to use. So first what we want to do is we want to give it our sprite, because it is a sprite component, and we want to use our sprite just like we normally do. So we can do sprite, and then we need to pass in an image Anytime we use images, we're using them from cache, so we need to get a reference to our game. So at the top, we can do with has game ref, 
and then we'll pass in pixel adventure. And now we can actually call our images from our game by going to game. Uh, dot images dot from cache just like we're used to and then this folder structure we know where it is because we just put it there it's hud and then jump button dot png perfect so that'll grab in our sprite and then we want to make sure that we also give our sprites a position um, again we're not passing it in we're going to just hard code this information so we can do position equals vector 2 and then we need to give it an x and a y well for our jump button we actually have want it at the bottom right of our screen so we need to get the actual width and height of our game so for our x we can do this by going to game.size x which is the width of our game but we need to subtract from it in a certain amount of distance which we'll call a margin but a certain amount of difference from the screen if you remember with our um, joystick we're pushing it by 32 uh, so we'll do the same by doing 32 and then we also need to subtract the uh, width of our button itself which we just made which is 64 um, so we'll do minus 32 minus 64 and then we want the same for the y we want it at the very bottom of our screen so we can do game.size.y minus 32 and then minus 64 and essentially what we're saying is we're getting the very bottom or the very edge of our screen on the width we're getting the far right and then we're subtracting a fixed margin which is 32 and then we're also subtracting our size because we need to go you know the width of our image so we're subtracting the 64 now we don't want to use magic numbers so what we can do up here is we can do final margin equals 32 and then we'll do final uh, we'll just call this button size equals 64 and then we can replace the 32 uh, with uh, margin and then we can replace the 64 um, with button size so game size dot x aka the width of our screen minus margin minus the button size and then game size dot y the height of our screen minus margin minus button size Perfect. Now we can actually see how this will work. So let's go ahead and save this. Now what we need to do is add it to our game. So we can go into our um, pixel adventure, not our level. We'll go into our game itself. And right here where we're showing our joystick, I want to change this from show joystick to show controls because now we have a, uh, a joystick and, uh, and, uh, and a um, jump button. So we can come down to where we changed it. Actually, let's show you. I'll show you a shortcut here. If we want to change our Boolean, we can select it, hit Control D as many times that it's actually used. There we go. That should be it. And then we can change it. So show controls. And this will change it everywhere that we've used that. Makes it very easy to replace names if you find a better name later. Cool. So if we're showing controls, we're adding a joystick, but we also want to just add and then we can add our jump button. Perfect. And because we're not making this dynamic, we don't have to pass in any information. We're just going to add the jump button. And if we refresh, well, we won't see anything because our show controls are false at the moment. So we'll switch that to true and then refresh them. Now, because of how I have my game set up, these are actually at the very bottom of the screen. We want to do this because it'll make sense on a mobile device. If the mobile device is wider, it's always going to be at the same distance from the screen. Um, but it does make it a little hard to see when we're using it this way. So I'll minimize my game a little bit more. Uh, just so you can kind of see it. So here we go. Now we are getting a few issues here and the issues that we're getting right now is our game because we've made so many changes. Our game is actually on top of our controls, which we don't want. So to do this, we can come down to our joystick component and then we actually have the ability to pass in a priority. So we will actually pass, uh, pass in a priority of 10, which means it's 10 layers above zero and our game is normally at zero so this will sit 10 layers above and if you see when we refresh our joystick is good um, but we need to do the same for our jump button so right under where we do the position we'll do the priority equals 10 as well and again these are 
there's not really layers, but it's treated like there's layers. So it's 10 layers above zero and our game is probably at zero and our background's at negative and stuff like that. So just keep in mind the invisible the layers are kind of not really there, but that's how priority works. So we want a really high number. If you ever see stuff is in front of stuff when it shouldn't be, it's because of the priority. And then if you want it closer to the player, AKA the viewer, then make it a higher number. If you want it further from the player, the viewer, you make it a negative number. Perfect. So now that we have our button, but our button doesn't do anything. Uh, we want our button when we click it to actually do stuff. So to do this, we can come back to our jump button and we just need to pass in our tap callbacks. So we can add a comma after our uh, has game ref and we'll call tap callbacks. And then for tap callbacks to work, we need to go to our game as well and say that we also have tap callbacks. Uh, this is saying, hey, we have tap callbacks in our game. And then this is saying, hey, we're using tap callbacks. Perfect. But now when we're calling the tap callbacks, we actually have the ability to do on tap down, which tracks when we've clicked our button down. Now we don't have any indication that we've clicked it down. You could definitely do that if you want. You can get another image, maybe highlight it, stuff like that. But we don't need that for now. But we are going to track when our uh, when our player touches it, when it taps it down. And what do we need to do? Well, all we need to do is grab a reference to our player and set it has jumped to true. So we can do game dot player because that's we're grabbing our game. Now we're grabbing our player. And then we can just set has jumped equals to true because we've already set this up in our player that one has jumped, AK we've detected we've jumped to do something. So if we refresh and click this, now our player can jump, which is perfect. However, if we actually spam this and let go, our player still jumps one more time, which is not what we want. So to do to fix this, we can just do on tap up. There we go. And then we can just do the complete opposite. Game.player.hasjumped equals false. So when our player clicks down, it's going to say that our jump is true. And when we release touching it, it's going to say that our has jumped is false. Perfect. And now if we spam that, it should only jump. And then when we stop, it stops. But yeah. That's all we have to do to get our player jumping with a button. We make the button, we add the button to the screen, we make sure that it's visible, and then we can click it. And now uh, spacebar still works, which is great, um, but we can also jump. Perfect. So yeah, we now have the ability to jump and this will work on mobile, which is great. So now that we have jumping set up, what we want to do is we need to go through and fix a lot of bugs that we've encountered throughout this, uh, you know, session or series of coding. For example, one bug is when we resize our screen, it normally messes up our background. So we're gonna wanna fix that. Um, but the biggest bug, I don't know if you've noticed this yet, and that background's terrible, I can't wait to fix that. But you haven't noticed this yet, but our jumping is not the same on all devices. Right now I'm on Windows and our like a Windows screen on my computer, and the jump is pretty good because that's what we've been coding it for. However, if I build this on a mobile device, which I'll show you in a moment. All right, so here we are on a mobile device, and if we jump, our jump is crazy high. What? What is going on? Well, the issue is we're using delta time, and delta time is very important because if we talked about it before, delta time means that we don't have to worry about your frame rate. If your frame rate is low, it's going to be the same amount of time as if your frame rate is high and, and all of that stuff. But that's not always true. It is true for some things, but it's not true for other things. And that's kind of the issue. So we want to go ahead and fix this. I'll keep the mobile version up for now because it's a way that we can test if it's working or not. Um, but the reason right now is because of our delta of time it doesn't work nicely with physics so what we need to do is we can actually close out of this stuff because we're good what we need to do is go into our player.dart file and we need to add something that's actually we need to like implement like a fixed delta time um, and a fixed delta time will allow us to realize hey when it comes to physics stuff we don't want our player to be able to jump higher just because it has a higher frame rate or 
or I think it's the opposite. Are players able to drop higher because it's a lower frame rate? I don't, this stuff gets a little confusing, but I'll show you how to fix it so we don't have to deal with this problem. And that way our jumping and all of that is more uh, close to what it's supposed to be regardless of the device that we're playing on. So to do this, we're going to go into our player.dart file. We do need to create two new variables, which we'll put right here. We'll do a double and then this one we'll just call it fixed delta time just because I know what that means and we're going to do one divided by 60 and what this is saying is we're essentially targeting 60 fps so the easiest way to do that is just one divided by 60 means we're targeting a 60 fps and then we need to add another variable this is going to be a double and it's going to be called accumulated time and by default it's going to be zero we're going to track the amount of time that has passed and then uh, in our update function and then once we've hit a certain amount then we're going to well, you'll see. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain. But in our update function, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, taking our accumulated time and we're going to add to it our delta time. So every update section, uh, every second of our update, we're going to add our delta time to our accumulated time. And now what we need to do is we need to check to see if our accumulated time is greater than our fixed delta time, which is the one divided by 60. So we can do this by doing while accumulated time is greater than or equal to our fixed delta time, then we want to do some stuff. And what do we want to do? Well, we pretty much want to do everything that we're actually doing. We only want to do our code checks and all of that stuff if our accumulated time is greater than or equal to our fixed delta time. So we can cut all of this stuff out and put it inside of this so it's always running no more than that targeted 60 FPS. Now this is going to break, as you can see our game is now stopped, and the reason is because we're, we're adding to our accumulated time, but we're never subtracting from it. So what we need to do is just take our accumulated time and we're gonna minus equal our fixed delta time. So essentially we're adding to our accumulated time our delta time. We're then checking to see if our accumulated time is now greater than or equal to our fixed delta time. If it is, we're going to run all of this code and then we're going to take our accumulated time and we're going to subtract uh, our fixed delta time from it so we can kind of start over. If we save and refresh this, now when we actually perform stuff, we're still going to have the same error because we're passing in, I think this froze on me, uh, we might have to rebuild the whole game, but we want to make sure that with our delta time, instead of passing in our delta time, we want to pass in our new fixed delta time for updating our player movement and applying gravity, which will also pass it into our jumping. So this has broken my game. So give me a moment to reload it. All right, so I had to reload it. Uh, make sure that your accumulated time is inside your while loop. I actually put it outside of the while loop, which is yeah, while loops are crazy. If you don't have them correctly, they'll crash everything because they're just looping forever. Um, so make sure that your accumulated time minus equals fixed delta time is inside the while loop. And then we go. But now when we jump, our player is still jumping really, really high. But now that we're using our fixed delta time, it's actually correct. And if we go off of the mobile, well, actually, let's tweak it for mobile now. So let's change our jump force from 460. Let's drop this down to 260. And then if we refresh, it's actually going to be correct. And again, we need to focus our data on the lowest kind of uh, device because then um, if we because before we were checking it for our desktop right so our desktop needed a 460 because we weren't using delta time and our desktop was running like that but on our mobile the 460 was way too high so what we want to do is dial back the 460 so that it works for the mobile uh, which is in this case 260 that's a really good jump and now we can actually close off of the mobile and we can rebuild it for windows and then that should be pretty much the identical jump that we need. So I definitely recommend trying to test your heights and all of that on a mobile device, which is going to be uh, much needed to be offset. But now when you jump, as you can see, my mobile and my desktop are jumping almost the exact same height 
every single time because now it's linked to that fixed delta time rather than the delta time. And if you go back to the 460 that we had before on Windows, now that we've added in a fixed delta time, you would have seen that the 460 was not a good jump either. So I guess it doesn't matter if you test it on mobile or not, um, but it is very identical now, which is perfect. So we can go ahead and switch it back to 260 because that's what I want to have it as. And then now we can go on and fixing some other bug fixes, which is great. All right, so first we can turn off the controls because now that they're working, we don't need them on our desktop. So I'll just turn them off so I can keep it full screen. But now what we want to do is we want to fix our background scrolling. When I first did this, I didn't realize that there's actually a built-in function. Well, I did know that you can use parallax backgrounds, but I didn't know that it would work with my background because of how I wanted to do it. So what we can do is we can close out of all of this stuff, go to the level dot dart, and inside of our scrolling background, we can actually get rid of a lot of this stuff that I had you do that we no longer need. We no longer need the tile size, the num tiles, uh, so we can delete those out. We also don't need, um, well, we'll copy out this uh, background right here. There we go. We can cut that out, but we no longer need this for loop. We can keep the background. So essentially, we're going to get rid of our for loop and everything we used for our for loop. And then we can still do the background tile, but our background tile is going to take a position. And we can actually just pass in this position zero and zero. Perfect. So if we save and refresh this, we're now going to bake break our background. As you can see, our background is right here, but we can go ahead and fix it. So we can go into our background tile. And I do want to say a huge shout out to a viewer, uh, Jove Black. He actually showed me how to do this and improve this code. Uh, he also showed me how to improve some other stuff that we're going to fix in this as well. So really, thank you for the comments. I, I enjoyed talking with you and you helped me out a lot. And because of you, we get to fix our code and especially this because it's been driving me nuts. So in our background tile, instead of having a, um, a sprite component that we had before, we actually want to just switch this to a parallax components. And a parallax component by default has access to our game, so we don't actually need to include our game. And what we can do here is we still have our scroll speed, um, but we can actually get rid of our sprite, which is great. And instead of our sprite, um, we can also delete out our update. We no longer need our update either. So we can do everything just on our onload. So what we'll do here is instead of passing in a sprite, we need to pass in a parallax. And the parallax is going to await, and it has access to the game already. So we'll do game ref dot load parallax like so and then we need to give this a list of parallaxes so we can give it a list and now what we need to do we're getting an error on the await so switch this to async perfect and then we need to go ahead and give this a parallax so it's called a parallax uh, image data and then we just need to pass in the path to our, our image. So it's background slash dollar sign color because we're still passing in the color. So we can have dynamic colors and then dot PNG. Perfect. And then we can come out of this list and hit comma. And now we can pass in what we want to do with our parallax background. So to replicate what we did before, we can have a base velocity. And this is going to be a vector 2 with a 0 for the x. And on our y, we want it to be our negative r scroll speed. Now, how we're doing it this way, this 0.4 is going to be way too slow. So we're actually going to switch that to 40. We're then going to repeat, and this is the issue I had before. I didn't know you could just repeat parallax backgrounds. I mean, I guess I, I should have known that because that's what parallax backgrounds do. They repeat on a horizontal, but I didn't realize that they would repeat on horizontal and vertical. So we can do image repeat dot repeat. And then the last thing we need to do is just pass in a fill and we can do layer fill dot none. Perfect. And now when we save and reload this, we'll actually see the 
exact same thing we did before, but with far less code and it's perfect. We also can switch our size. We don't need to offset our size by a small amount. So we can just switch it to 64 and it still works perfect. And then we just wanna make sure that the priority is a little bit further behind our background. Uh, so we can make it negative 10, just so that nothing actually comes into play. So we were able to just use the built-in <laughs> function for a parallax to make our parallax background and it works perfectly. And the best part is when I resize the screen, it just works which is awesome. So I'm really sorry from the past video where we went through stuff that was kind of broken, but that's what you do. If you don't know the fix, you find something that works and then tweak it later if you find a better way. And that's really what coding is all about. Fix it today and I'll fix it tomorrow. <laughs> so cool. So again, thank you, Jove Black, for that. I mean, seriously, I, so much better. I appreciate you. Uh, and I asked you to help me with that. So I'm glad that you took your time to do that. So thank you. So now that we fix this, we can also delete out our game reference because we don't need it. We can get it by our parallax component. But now our level is good. Our background is good. We've shortened our code, which is great. Now let's move on to some more bug fixes. So the first bug fix that we have now that we fix the background tile, I won't necessarily say these are bug fixes, but we will go ahead and just make them work a little bit better. So inner level dot dart, we do want to make it if you've ever seen your player, I'll show you real quick. Let's make sure I don't get hit here. But if our player is going to come from the left, and go in when he spawns in on the next screen he's actually negative where he's supposed to be so we can fix this by in our when we spawn our player in we can just do um, player dot scale x uh, dot x equals one this will make it so he's always facing right if you have levels where he's going to be facing left then make this dynamic but right now we're not and that will fix that issue this way when he comes in from the left the right or whatever he's always going to be facing the same way um, that we want him to which is to the right Perfect, so we fix that little bug there. Uh, let's go ahead, what else do I have here? All right, so we're going to clean up some code in our player uh, file. Uh, so it's good that we're already in here. What we're gonna do is inside of our player, we're going to change our collision. Right now, our collision, uh, we're checking it over and over and over and over because I'm doing on collision. But there's a different collision that we can use, which actually solves a lot of our issues, which is on collision start. And what this does is it only triggers once. If you remember in our past videos, we made variables to see um, if we've triggered it. And then if we did, don't continue to check. Well, we can actually just use on collision start and it'll only trigger that once. So what we can do here is we can just replace everything that we have in our in on collision we can replace that in our on collision start and then that stuff will only trigger once so we can actually get rid of on collision altogether and just use on collision start so we can save that and refresh and we still get the same results uh, we can still jump into our saw and it still works perfectly next what we want to do is we need to change our delays one thing i had mentioned is we had to use a lot of these future dot delays and then make durations because there wasn't a way to actually track when our um, animation ended however Jove Black again, let me know that there is a way to track when the animation ends so we can continue our code. So on our respawn, we're gonna switch this to async because the way to do this is going to use an await. And what we can do is right below where we play our player hit and we add it in the uh, duration to wait for that to end, what we can do is we can actually just use the built-in way, which is await animation ticker and this could be null so we need to add a question mark and then we can just call completed and what this is saying is I'll wait for the animation ticker if it's completed once it's completed I'm not gonna do anything until it's completed once it's completed I'm gonna run the rest of the code now with our player we're using a lot of animation so once we've completed it we need to make sure that we reset it and to do that we can do animation ticker 
question mark again because could be null and then we can call the reset function now with our current version of um, flame this does not work it does not reset it again big shout out to Jove Black because he discovered that we need to upgrade our flame so we can do that by coming into our pub spec YAML and right where we have flame 1.8.0 we need to switch this to the newest version which is 1.8.0 two and then we can just hit save and then that way we don't get any issues with that reset uh, just trust me on that make sure you're at least on 1.8.2 uh, so that way we don't get errors on the reset but now that we've actually waited for our uh, animation to complete we can get rid of everything in this duration so we can cut it out paste it here and it's going to wait for our animation complete then it's going to reset the ticker and then it's going to run all of this code so we don't need to worry about this duration however we're calling another animation this time our appearing animation so what we need to do is we can do the same thing before we can do await animation ticker question mark dot completed oops completed there we go and then again, make sure that we reset it, animation ticker, question mark, dot reset. And now we don't need this delay. So we can take this delay. We still need this delay because I'm actually delaying the code um, based on my own personal preference. And that's really the only time that you should use the future delays if you want to delay something from happening. So we can actually delete this mess of inlined <laughs> uh, future delays and essentially, oops, I shouldn't have hit saved yet. That's my fault. Um, but what we can do, let's go back here. We're breaking it and I'll fix that in a moment. Um, but what we're doing here is we are, we can also get rid of these respawns. So we're essentially respawning where got hit is true. We're setting it to player state dot hit. We're going to wait for that to actually finish. We're going to reset it so we can use it again. Then we're going to run the code that we want to. Then we're going to wait for that to finish. Then we're going to reset it. Then we're going to run the rest of the code that we want to. And I did delete the can move. I need to actually keep that one. Perfect. Um, let's go ahead here. And then with our current animation appearing, appearing needs to be tweaked with our animation because at the moment, it's not our appearing that's broken, it's our hit animation. At the moment, our hit animation is looping. So this is never going to trigger because it's going to loop forever. And again, big shout out to Joe Black, shows me how to fix this. We can come up to our load all animations and next to our hit animation, we can actually use uh, the cascade operator, which is two dots. And then we can actually set this one to be loop equals false. So by default, all of our loops are true, but for this one, we can just say, hey, I want this one to be false and I only want it to play once. So the hit animation will only play once and then we can also track it with the respawn. So if we save and refresh, that should fix our issues with our game throwing that error. Perfect. So now when we get hit, it plays it once and then plays our animation. We are also running into an issue with our appearing and we need to switch our appearing so that it doesn't uh, loop as well. We could just do the dot dot loop, but since we don't want our appearing or our disappearing to loop, we can actually just switch them both right here on our special sprite animation. We can switch both of them to loop equals false. So again, if you're using hey, I want to track when it ends, it cannot loop. Otherwise, it'll loop forever because there is no end because it's looping. But now when we get hit, that should fix that. Perfect. And it works just like it does before, but now we're not using all of those future delays that are very confusing to keep track of, a lot of math involved, and we can just use the built-in function. Great. Now what we want to do is we want to do the same thing with our fruit. So we can come to our fruit and with our fruit, there's a few things that we can tweak as well. So again, we're using a delay here. We don't need to use a delay. We also don't need our collected anymore because if you remember in our player, these are if other is fruit, other dot collided with player is only happening once. So we can actually get rid of our collected because it's only going to trigger once and we don't need to track it anymore. We can get rid of our if statement. So we can cut this out 
and then we can get rid of all of the stuff that tracks the collected. Also, now that we've used an animation, we can do the same thing that we did before with the uh, ticker. So we can do await animation ticker question mark dot completed. And then again, with the wait, you need to make sure that it's async. And then we can just cut out the remove from parent and get rid of the future dot delayed. And again, much easier to read. And we don't need to reset this one because we're literally removing the fruit from existence once we um, the ticker is done. So we don't need to reset it. We're not using it again. We're just getting rid of it. But yeah, so that cleans up our fruit code. And then we also want to go ahead and clean up our checkpoint code. So we can go into our checkpoint. Same as before, let's scroll down to our on collision. We don't want to use on collision. Uh, we don't have to. Instead, we can use on collision start. And again, if I haven't said it enough, thanks again to <laughs> Joe Black for uh, letting me know about using on collision start. I really appreciate it. And then we can just take out of our code from on collision and paste it onto our code on collision start. Perfect. We can also, uh, when we come down here to our, we no longer need the tracking of our checkpoint. So we can get rid of the Boolean because again, uh, we'll actually track this. So we can get rid of it here and we'll get rid of it here because it's only triggering once. We don't need to check if it's already triggered. It can only trigger once. Uh, so animation, perfect. And then right underneath our animation, we no longer need this await. Uh, we can do await. Again, make sure we switch to async. We can do await and then animation ticker question mark dot completed. Perfect. And then we can get rid of this delay. So the delay is we're just going to do another animation. So we can get rid of all of that. Perfect. And then, yeah, that should work fantastic. Uh, we just want to make sure our loop falls. Perfect. Let's save and refresh. And now if we play our game, we can actually make it full screen because it doesn't break my background anymore. But if we play our game, oh, we got hit. That works perfect. Oh, we've collected our fruit. Those work perfect. Let's go ahead. Oh, just kidding. Let's go ahead over here and collect all of our fruit. And then let's hit our checkpoint. Checkpoint plays. Plays only once switches to the idle, switches the game, and there we go. So there you go, we've gone ahead and made our code better, fixed a few bugs that we ran into, nothing major, but that's gonna happen. But then we've also gone ahead and made it where we can jump on mobile, which was very important. You can actually build this game for your mobile phone now, and it's actually playable. Um, if you don't know how to do that, uh, you just control tilde, and then do flutter build APK and then uh, plug your phone in and then um, just do flutter install and it'll install it right to your phone. Hopefully you already know how to do that. Uh, but if not, that's how you would build it for your phone. Make sure if you are gonna build it for your phone, you go to Pixel Adventure and then make sure that you turn the show controls on and then uh, you can rebuild it. <laughs> Forgot about that. Again, if you're building for mobile, make sure show controls is true. And then once it's built, uh, plug your phone in and hit Flutter install. This will uninstall my old version and then install the new version and then you'll actually have the game working on your phone, which is great. You'll also have the controls. Maybe I'll put that on the screen so you can see me playing that on the game. All right, so here the game is on my phone and I can actually use my actual fingers to play the game, which is awesome. And then we can go ahead and finish the game, finish the level. It's gonna take us to the next level, but now you can see what the controls actually look like on a real game. I still have some issues with the joystick. I'm wondering if it's slightly too small, but definitely something we can tweak in the future if needed. But the best part is it's actually working properly on a mobile device. We have controls so we can play. So definitely if you have an Android phone or iPhone, install it to your phone and play with it. 
And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I think maybe in the next video we'll add some sound. Let me know in the comments if you want sound or what else you want. I also want to be able to add in some enemies, which is great. So definitely let me know what you'd like to see. Also, real quick, if you're still watching this video, I really appreciate it. You're definitely a super fan. Consider clicking the join button to help support this channel. We do have memberships unlocked now. You can become a code explorer. Um, it's up to you if you want to. I'd appreciate it if you do. If you can't, that's fine. Just watching the video this far the whole way through helps out a lot. Helps us reach uh, the next step of YouTube partnership so we can actually get ads and make some money that way. But if you want to support the channel, that's one great way. Let me know your thoughts in the description of what to do next. I really appreciate you watching these videos and all the support you've shown me on the channel so far. And I'm super excited to continue the series. So let's keep uh, let's keep making games.